to present our data. And I would like to talk about um, uh, a more or less biological problem about um, air acting dynamics that directs velocity of cell migration. Because uh, Margaret gave a really nice introduction yesterday, I just want to um, uh, uh, talk briefly about the cell migration itself. So this process is required for um, um, embryogenesis, tissue repair and wound healing, as well as um, immune responses, but it is also responsible for um, tumor formation and metastasis as well uh, as for some uh, brain defects. <clears throat> so migration is a four-step process that includes the protrusion that usually occurs at the leading edge of the migrating cell and the formation of uh, new adhesions that occur also at the leading edge and then the contraction of cell movement or movement of the cell body and finally, the dissolution or um, de-adhesion that occurs at the rear of the back of the cell. So this is an example of um, a, a migrating um, TR2 sites, and you can really see that it forms protrusion at the leading edge, whereas it's retracting at the back. Here you can see actually the um, uh, uh, retraction fiber. This is well, it's not so good to see. Probably this is um, <clears throat> in a large region of um, uh, a cell that was transiently transfected with um, and cherry actin. And you can see actually, uh, besides uh, membrane ruffling, the protrusion, as well as the retract retraction. Um, uh, besides actin polymerization that is required for cell migration, um, rho GTPAs has played also an essential role in this, uh, during this process. Um, and there are uh, primarily three major uh, GTPases, CDC42, row A, and RAG1, that are involved in the formation of specific um, actin-containing structures. So CDC42 is responsible for the formation of um, uh, philopodia, whereas row A is responsible for uh, formation of stress fibers and focal adhesions, and RAG1 is involved in the formation of lambda proteins. Um, all these um, low GTPAs a cycle between an, an active or a GTP bound state where it can bind to um, factors or they can um, um, stay an inactive or GTP bound state. <clears throat> For our experiments, um, we used um, the human oral keratinocytes. Um, this is an immortalized cell line, um, and the first, or the, the, the image on top, shows you an um, immune stain for actin in red and tubular in green. And you can see that this is really a, a polarized cell with a leading edge where you have philopodia and membrane ruffles present. And at the back, you have that action retraction fiber. Um, at the bottom, there are, um, you can see a migrating cell um, um, visualized with DIC microscopy. Here's a, a, a little set of um, two um, um, dividing cells uh, visualized by um, video microscopy. To study cell migration, uh, today there are actually three um, ways, three common ways. Uh, the first and the classical one is the subculture, where you have a, a subculture vessel, vessel, roll your cells, and then monitor the process of cell migration for a certain time period. Then you have that um, <coughs> wound closure or stretch assays that you can use to study cell migration. For this, um, you're using um, usually a tip, a pipette tip, um, uh, produce a gap in the middle of a subculture dish and um, follow the, the gap closure over time. And then, I never used this actually, but um, obviously there are some labs that use fluorescent beads, um, um, and they followed uh, these beads by fluorescent microscopy, and they were able to track those cells. <clears throat> 
The next slide shows actually one of these um, classical scratch assays that we have performed. And um, here you can see, I hope it's working. Um, so this is for a period of 12 hours. And um, I'll pray again. So here you have the gap, and you can see that the cells or single cells start to migrate into this gap, and over time that this gap is really closed up with uh, cells that are moving uh, into this gap. How big is that gap? It's about 200 nanometer, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, good. Because scratch assays are not the best solution, in our opinion, or it's not really comfortable to use this, um, we decided to um, perform uh, sort of long-term live cell imaging and to study cell migration. And um, luckily, the uh, microscope uh, manufacturers um, um, made some, some toys available. So here we have, um, and we have tested actually both system, systems. Um, so one is uh, from Nikon, and this is a so-called BioStation. And the other one, the other system was um, designed by Olympus and it's uh, called the <coughs> incubator microscope. Um, I just want to talk briefly or mention briefly that um, this system is um, uh, or contains phase contrast optics and there's space for only um, a single 35 millimeter dish, which is um, um, sort of limiting. Um, whereas the um, uh, incubator microscope from Olympus um, provides a rotating disk in, in the, inside the incubator and there is space for um, up to eight uh, 35 millimeter dishes which allows you to um, do a lot of um, experiments simultaneously. And in addition, this system uh, contains DLC optics which allows you uh, better imaging of um, the, uh, the cell migration itself. <coughs> So um, the next step is when we've collected uh, the data with uh, one, of, or, uh, one of these systems, um, and then we transfer them into a metamorph for further motion analysis. So I want you, what we have used is that track objects tool, which allows you to place rectangular regions um, in, the, in, in the, the area of interest. And um, <clears throat> Over time, you can um, follow um, the tracking process. So this would be here at the beginning, and this is um, where the tracking process is right now. And finally, you're ending up with a whole bunch of data that allows you to um, um, characterize the movement of individual cells or cell groups. So this, uh, for instance, you can uh, get data about position, velocity, um, as well as distances. Um, in addition, we performed chymographic analysis to um, get further um, uh, information about um, um, leading edge activities. So here we have a uh, DIC image uh, of a uh, keratinocyte. We placed um, a couple of um, lines um, in the regions of interest, and you can create um, those uh, chymographs or uh, time distance plots, which allows you to um, <coughs> follow um, the, the movement of the leading edge, and you can clearly distinguish with, between protrusion and retraction activity, as well as you can see that uh, the structures that are moving. So in this case here, we have a lamellar podium that is protruding and retraction, uh, retracting, and here you can see a filler podium that is actually protruding or retracting. <coughs> um, with this in mind, um, we have created sort of a um, 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 motility cell migration assay where we can monitor um, uh, cell groups, not only single cells, cell groups. And this is um, um, this is a movie that covers actually um, 30 minutes, a period of 30 minutes. And these are, um, um, let's say, um, control cells that, uh, that, are, that were cultured in 35 millimeter dishes. And you can see that you have protrusion and retraction activity, that the cells are um, sort of connected and um, circling randomly around. When you analyze this movement <coughs> with the metamorph software, um, you, you're able to create um, this migration path and you can um, really see that these cells um, have a non-synchronous or randomly movement and uh, <coughs> if you do this uh, chymographic analysis, 
you can see that the protrusion velocity of the instantaneous velocity ranges from about 1 to 1.5 microns. So this is what is uh, pretty straightforward. So you can collect um, 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 uh, not only um, data from single cells, but only from cell groups. And the next step, we were asking, so how can we um, um, author the cell migration? What can we do to, to get um, further information about changes? So and this is when we got in touch with microbiologists. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can present now the second key player in our uh, migration assay. And this is Candida albicans that we are adding actually to our uh, <coughs> cultures. Candida albicans is, as stated here, a human pathogen. And um, to make it straight, it can actually kill um, individuals under special circumstances. This pathogenic fungus exists in three um, um, isoforms. So typical, um, you have, um, a, it stays in the yeast form, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It can stay in an uh, intermediate state, state um, and produce this uh, so-called pseudo hyphae or um, um, really true hyphae, which, is, which represent a multi-nucleate uh, filament. So when we added uh, those fungus to our cultures, you can see that the, that the uh, migration of those uh, human or sites is changing dramatically. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that you can clearly see that the fungus is growing, so it forms really nice hyphae, and that the cell migration, or the cell sheet is migrating more uh, syn uh, synchronous, uh, more directed in one way. Um, we don't know whether this is chemotaxis or not, um, but obviously there's something going on with these cell cultures. When we analyzed um, <coughs> these, um, these, uh, these cells um, further, you can see indeed that these, these cells move as a sheet, synchronous, and uh, it's, it's more directive for some reason. So, <coughs> um, analyzing um, or using chymographs for further analysis, we, can, uh, we were able to see that the instantaneous velocity um, increased dramatically, so now we're reaching uh, up to four microns per minute for um, individual cells. Next, we um, plotted, actually, um, or we created a, a graph where we plotted um, these instantaneous velocities and compared instantaneous, instantaneous velocities of untreated cultures versus cultures that were uh, treated with C. albicans for three and six hours. And we were able to see that um, the, the, the untreated cultures and um, even the, the three-hour uh, uh, instantaneous velocities for the three-hour time interval showed a, a, a normal distribution, whereas at the six-hour time interval, we were able to um, pick up a, a bimodal distribution with um, actually two major peaks, um, one at around 1.5 micron, and the second one is around uh, 2.5 micron. When we um, compared the migration rate of these um, cells that were moving um, under different um, conditions, so we can show or we could show that untreated cultures uh, move at an average of one, one, one micron per minute, whereas um, um, cultures that were treated with C. albicans for six hours, um, they showed an increase of about two. So the next thing we did, we looked more closely to the actin filament uh, system itself because obviously there, is, there are some changes going on that are triggered by um, the presence of this um, fungus. So um, we fixed and uh, stained cells um, with rhodamine phalloidine at defined time intervals. So when you, when you look at the untreated cultures, <coughs> you primarily, or you can see that those cells exhibited primarily um, philopodia. Um, at three hour time interval, we were able to see um, um, primarily um, uh, stress fibers and focal adhesions. And at the later time interval, um, these cells exhibited um, um, lamellopodia, extensive lamellopodia. 
Um, in control experiments, we use Saccharomyces cerevisiae that were um, um, co-cultured these, with these um, oral keratinocytes. And you, um, as you can see, there's not a big difference between untreated cultures and those that were treated with um, Saccharomyces. And finally, we were, able, we, we were interested in whether the actin, actin dynamics is really affected. So we've um, uh, transiently transfected um, this cell line, this YFP actin, and in this image you can see um, um, a single cell um, in an untreated cultures, and I think it's really nicely um, that the protrusion and detraction activity of philopodia uh, visible, whereas at, uh, in the presence of um, candida, Albicans, you can see um, clearly that actin stress fibers and vocal adhesions are present and that the, the protrusion and retraction cycle is, is affected as well. So when we, when we co-culture um, these cells um, with candida for six hours, you can see a, a really nice lamellopodium and an, I would say an increased protrusion and retraction activity. It's actually the same uh, play rate, so these are 10 frames per second. So um, and finally, this is our control again, the culture that was um, um, treated with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and you can see that this, these cells behave similar um, uh, in terms of actin uh, dynamics as um, untreated cultures. So, um, from this one we can conclude that C. albicans, the pathogenic fungus, can alter the actin filament dynamics and can increase the cell migration of human oral keratinocytes in, in, at early time in the adults. We did not observe actin remodeling when, when Saccharomyces cerevisiae was added to um, cultures of human uh, uh, keratinocytes. And we um, and make the statement that um, C. albicans probably activate the raw rock signaling pathway. Finally, I would like to show a, a working model. We have uh, more evidence, but the time is not enough. Um, and um, this diagram shows um, the sort of the sequential changes and the actin cytoskeleton caused by um, C. albicans. So it is well known, and we have shown that, that this fungus can uh, secrete virulence factors into the medium and uh, cause actually changes in the actin uh, cytoskeleton. So, um, we are starting with philopodia and microspikes in untreated cultures, but at um, later time intervals, um, we see that <coughs> cells exhibited focal adhesions and stress fibers, as well as lamellipodia and, and membrane ruffles at the six hour time. So, finally, I uh, would like to thank some of our um, collaborators. Um, this is uh, work done by Christiane Lauren Hardy. Um, a postdoc from uh, in Paula Sundström's lab at Dartmouth Medical School, and this is our former technician Mary Yang. Um, she has um, developed the, the um, or she she made it possible to transfect those cells since it's a little tricky because you have to keep them at a really low contourant level, and you know you can't use electroporation in one of this classical um, stuff that is available. Thank you. <coughs> Results if you uh, use fungus conditioned media and just add that without the actual pathogens? You, 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 we, just, we see this effect. It's a little bit delayed. So, obviously, um, um, you need the presence of the fungus as well. So, there, there um, and I can tell you that, um, that these fungus uh, uh, are the fungi secreting um, SAPs, and these are aspartyl proteases that are responsible for uh, these changes. But it is not known what the receptor is on the cell. So, so if someone you know can figure that out. That's, yeah. Any other questions? Well, let's thank the speaker again.